Hi, everybody. Sorry, we had a couple <laughs> difficulties there um, for a minute. Um, I want to welcome everybody. Um, good morning and, and welcome to the PRS CBD for Pharmacy webinar. My name is Linda Barnes and I'm the Director of Marketing and Strategic Alliances for PRS. For those of you who may not be familiar with PRS, we are a pharmacist owned and operated independent pharmacy consulting firm that has been working to help independents since 1982 with everything from compliance to brokerage and now CBD education. We understand that CBD is a very confusing subject. There's a lot of information out there about CBD, but is it accurate? How can you tell what is fact or fiction? We understand that pharmacists need to educate themselves about CBD so they can educate their customers and their community. We believe CBD belongs in a pharmacy, not a gas station. And we're guessing that you all feel the same way as well because we had an overwhelming response to this webinar. Hundreds of pharmacies registered and we had over 200 questions uh, when those registrations came in. So we had initially wanted to unmute everyone and really make this webinar interactive, but with so many attendees, the background noise would cause too much interference. So instead, we will try to answer as many of your initial questions as we can um, in the first half of this webinar. And what we're asking is that you send us your additional questions via the chat feature, which should be located on the bottom right side panel of your screens. Tim will spend the second half of the webinar answering these questions live. Before I introduce Tim, let me start by reviewing some of the topics we're going to cover today. Hold on, I'm trying to advance the screen. I'm having a little bit of a, a technical issue here. So some of the topics that we're gonna to discuss today are, you know, what is CBD? Is it snake oil? We're gonna talk about the 2018 Farm Bill. We're gonna talk about the FDA and the state laws. We're going to talk about the ECS, why and how CBD works, and then drug information. And then again, we're gonna review those additional questions that you might have. So we have a lot to cover today. So let me introduce our CBD guru, uh, Tim Gregorius. He's a registered pharmacist. He's been with PRS for over 28 years. And as I mentioned, he's our resident CBD expert, having spent the last several years researching CBD for pharmacy as part of our new CBD initiatives here at PRS. He is most notably and recently working on a CBD for pharmacy education and manufacturer recommendation program with a national independent pharmacy organization. So without further delay, I'm turning it over to Tim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. We realize uh, that's a commitment on your part to take an hour out of your day, and I do personally appreciate it. So what is CBD? You know, we just said, is it snake oil? Is it medical marijuana? Why is it suddenly so popular? Everyone is talking about it everywhere. We see signs on the road, it's everywhere. Well, it's important that pharmacists be involved and we can't afford to be bystanders here. But to answer the question, what is CBD? It's a simple answer. It is a drug. Uh, specifically, it's an FDA-approved drug. Epidiolex was uh, granted uh, prescription uh, level last June, uh, June of 18, actually. So let, let me move on to talking about CBD, and we'll get back to Epidiolex and, and some of the specifics about Epidiolex. But one of the, uh, the main active ingredients, uh, technically called phytocannabinoids in cannabis sativa, is CBD. Cannabis sativa has two main strains that have been basically genetically modified to adjust the levels of THC in the plant. That which we typically call marijuana is by definition the cannabis sativa plant having a THC level of above 0.3%. And it also has uh, all of the natural components of this uh, 
uh, greater than 100 phytocannabinoids. The other strain is now being loosely defined as industrial hemp, and that is a relatively new term, uh, and I'll explain that in a couple of moments too uh, about what happened uh, over the past 12 months. But industrial hemp, by definition, has less than 0.3% THC. So that uh, becomes not marijuana at that point. And the CBD that we're going to be discussing and CBD uh, in general that is going to be discussed in terms of pharmacy, we're going to be talking about CBD derived from industrial hemp. CBD is not psychoactive. It will not get you high. It is not what gets you high in the marijuana plant. It is the THC. And this seems to be a major point of contention that I just want to clear up in a couple of uh, bold statements right at the top of this webinar. It is not medical marijuana. Uh, when we're talking medical marijuana, we're talking about several other avenues of using the cannabis sativa plant where uh, someone may actually be prescribed uh, the the, the marijuana that we would know as pot that we're smoking. Uh, CBD is derived from industrial hemp and is not medical marijuana. Before discussing the dosing of CBD, and we had a lot of questions, you know, Linda mentioned that uh, you know, we, we, we had several hundred questions and we, we were able to group those. And one of the main areas of questioning was about drug information for CBD, the dosing, the mechanism of action. Uh, what is the endocannabinoid system? What are CBD receptors? Does it undergo first pass metabolism? What are the side effects, bioavailability, the pharmacogenetics, and so on? Uh, before we, we get into that, and I will, and, and I will try to answer all the questions uh, regarding the, the drug information about CBD, but I think we first need to make sense of the 2018 Farm Bill. As I'm about to do that, uh, it, it's it's hard to discussion the Teen Farm Bill without discussing the FDA's stance. As well, uh, a lot of your questions revolved around the FDA's stance on CBD and the legalities in different states. But let me first uh, define what the Farm Bill is and allow it to, to sort of create a foundation for you and a little bit of context. Uh, as uh, as we look at why CBD has become such a, a a major force in our culture right now. So the 2018 Farm Bill, there were two main takeaways that, that we can uh, look at for this discussion. One is the Farm Bill basically removed hemp that has less than 0.3% THC from a controlled substance C1 classification. So there is now a designation that it, there is this uh, item called industrial hemp that has no THC, therefore it is not dealt with under any consideration of, uh, of uh, a class one, a schedule one. Also important to say that on the exact same day that President Trump signed the farm bill in December, the FDA made a, a major announcement. They, they piggybacked the farm bill announcement by saying that in a, in a forceful statement, they still had full jurisdiction over cannabis and cannabis derived products, regardless of whether they fall under the definition of hemp or marijuana. So the FDA stepped in on day one and said, we're, we're still in charge of CBD. Let's not pretend that the farm bill took us out of the equation. So the farm bill, the second main thing that it did is it gave states broad authority to regulate and limit production and sale of hemp and hemp products. To quote, states cannot limit the transportation of hemp through their jurisdictions. I'm going to come back to that in a second. So they gave the states uh, this broad regulation authority. The FDA did, or the, the Department of Agriculture didn't want that authority, but at the same time they said the states cannot limit the transportation of hemp through their jurisdictions. So this farm bill hit in December, people celebrated, business boomed, the commercial market for CBD went nuts, it exploded. 
Since December, we've seen CBD in every dosage form. It's invaded coffee shops, restaurants, gas stations, uh, salons, video stores, supermarkets, and of course, vape shops. Well, this explosion, it, it, it's, you know, when we start surveying Americans, as you can read there, one in four Americans have admitted trying CBD in the last 24 months. <clears throat> While all this explosion was going on, the FDA realized they needed to make a statement, but they also realized they didn't have enough information to make a statement. Therefore, the FDA said, look, we can no longer ignore these issues. They held a public hearing on May 31st, just a couple of weeks ago. Matter of fact, two weeks tomorrow. And I, and I will certainly have some things to say about that, but I just wanna uh, reiterate here that CBD is now mainstream and like it or not, people are taking it, but the FDA is saying they're taking it and we really haven't made any determination of safety and effectiveness. And as we know, the FDA's primary concern is always uh, the, the public at large and whether or not there are uh, safe drugs and items into the, the food supply. Let me read the actual words. I'm gonna read a quote here uh, by Dr. Nelson Sharpless, who is the acting commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. I'm really uh, gonna try not to read many slides, but this one I, I do wanna read out loud. Our biggest concern is the marketing of products that put the health and safety of consumers at risk, such as those claiming to prevent, diagnose, mitigate, treat, or cure serious diseases, such as cancer, in the absence of requisite approvals. Selling unapproved drug products with unsubstantiated therapeutic claims is a violation of the law and puts patients at risk. Patients and other consumers may be influenced not to use approved therapies to treat serious and even fatal diseases. That being said, the agency does not have a policy of enforcement discretion with respect to any CBD products. That last line means they, they have not gone so far as to say, uh, if we deem it necessary, we will come after and, uh, and may have take enforcement action over people who are, are putting the public at risk. So this is a, a tricky one uh, to make a prediction. Uh, Dr. Sharpless, if, if you're on the call, uh, this, is, this is just my opinion. I'm really not trying to uh, influence you one way or the other. But the prediction that, that I, I, I feel comfortable making right now is that the FDA is probably going to have to create a threshold between an RX and an OTC dose. Folic acid is a potential model for, for what I'm suggesting here. It is, uh, it is a scary situation that the drug is already out there, but now we've got uh, states making rules, the FDA not having stepped in and given sp explicit direction on what to do, and we have millions of people using CBD every day. So when we start to look at these rulings by individual states, let alone each state's board of pharmacy, which is when it really gets sticky, uh, we really start to see the complexity of the problem. Recall earlier that I mentioned the farm bill stated that states cannot limit the transportation of hemp. Well, at least one state said, oh yes we can. Uh, Idaho maintains that hemp, since it has THC, it's therefore a C1, it's a schedule one drug. That's tricky because if it's on a truck coming into Idaho, they don't know that that's industrial hemp. That just as well could be marijuana on those trucks. So they have made the decision, Idaho has specifically, that if we think it's marijuana and we can't be sure, we don't want it in our state. South Dakota and Nebraska have made the same sorts of rulings. So for any of you that are in those three states, uh, I, I would be very careful. And, and things are changing as we speak, but I would still be very careful. I've not seen anything to compare to this national confusion in pharmacy in my four decades in the profession. And that mainly has come about because the internet provided a vehicle for tens of millions of people to begin using a product 
before the FDA and the profession of, of pharmacy could get in front of the problem. As a result of playing catch up, individual states are all over the board as far as CBD rules and regulations. Uh, again, I, I let off saying I, I don't really like to read slides during a webinar, but I also don't want to uh, read some or, or state some incorrect information. So I'm actually going to read a, a, a few notes that detail legislation that is in six or seven states right now that are literally being rewritten as we speak. On April 24th, so two months ago, the Texas House passed HB 1325, making it legal to sell CBD if it has less than 0.3% THC. The Senate passed the same bill on May 15th, so now it's waiting to be signed by the governor of Texas. And uh, reading the bill, if the governor signs it, it will go into effect immediately. If the governor doesn't sign the bill, it will still automatically go into effect on September 1st of 2019. And this does mandate that anyone selling CBD must first register with the Texas Health Department. So that's, that's a one-off. I haven't really heard that anywhere else except Texas. Uh, Missouri, as of the June issue of the Missouri Pharmacist, the State Agriculture Department is requiring that if a business sells CBD of greater than 5% strength, which presumably all of the CBD products that, that we're gonna have on shelves in pharmacies are gonna be greater than a 5% strength, that those must be licensed. Today, I wouldn't sell CBD in a pharmacy in Missouri. And if I were going to be selling it, I would wanna make absolutely sure that it had no THC, because that's again where they're drawing the line. But the state board in Missouri, and this is thanks to a friend of ours in Missouri, uh, the state board has said that since CBD is a drug, a pharmacy selling it opens itself to action by the board. So we're waiting for further word from the State Board of Pharmacy in Missouri. West Virginia, on the other hand, last June, June 25th, the Board of Pharmacy put out a word, put out word that CBD was prohibited in a pharmacy. <clears throat> On April 12th of this year, the State Board withdrew that prohibition effective immediately, but it warned that according to their testing and sampling, one third of the samples they personally tested had THC in them. This makes it even more important that you begin to have a lot of trust in the manufacturer if you're gonna be selling CBD products. Because if it's saying no detectable THC, you want some proof of that. A Couple more states here. Last fall, the state of Maine stated that food or food products containing hemp derived CBD was prohibited, hemp derived CBD. On March 27th of this year, HP 0459 and LD 630 stated, and I quote, an emergency act to clarify. So the, the, the House and the Senate thought it was important that they clarify that wording. So they made a distinction between hemp and marijuana using again, that 0.3% threshold. So it is no longer prohibited if derived from hemp. Once again, the state board goes on to warn rightly that the seller will make no therapeutic claims back to the FDA wording. In Louisiana, last November, Louisiana was on record as stating that Controlled Substance Act includes CBD in the definition of marijuana. And, and again, I'll quote the uh, Louisiana position, no one may possess or sell CBD oil in Louisiana. However, on June 1st, so again, we're just talking a couple of weeks ago, the Senate legalized the growing of industrial hemp, distinguishing it from marijuana. And this is huge. The State Board of Pharmacy has been silent on this issue. So that's the Department of Agriculture and, and the, the House in, in Louisiana, but the State Board, it's not okay, uh, according to the State Board. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of each of you checking with your individual state board when, when, you're, when you're deciding whether to sell CBD or not. And you can see how, how recent these changes are, uh, you know, in, in terms of over the last couple of weeks, there are laws literally being passed uh, allowing CBD sales. And we, we couldn't have this discussion without at least mentioning California. On May 16th of this year, uh, 
House Bill AB228 passed and stating that CBD from industrial hemp is now not illegal in California. Uh, doesn't say it's legal, but they, they did specifically say it is not illegal. Uh, once again, the State Board of Pharmacy is silent. Your best move is to, uh, before you take any decision, to sell CBD and what you're, uh, what you're planning to do moving forward, check with your State Board of Pharmacy. So there are several other states that, um, as we have been talking about, if you could go back a slide, Linda, just to have those states up there, thank you. Uh, Alabama, Maryland, North Carolina, Florida, these are, are states where the State Board of Pharmacy has stepped in and said, we recommend you don't have CBD products on your shelves, but there are five, 500 pharmacies, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the number we looked at in the state of Florida, that are already selling CBD. So what does a Florida pharmacist do? I don't have that answer other than what I've stated already a couple of times. Uh, Minnesota uh, has recently, meaning in the last couple of weeks, I believe, come out and made that same recommendation. Don't have CBD in your pharmacy shelves until we, uh, until we make a ruling. Ohio, the same thing. And uh, as an interesting note, uh, Connecticut is, is saying, yeah, we really shouldn't. Uh, Connecticut is a very interesting one because two weeks ago, uh, my belief was it was okay in Connecticut. And then we heard, no, nope, illegal in Connecticut. And now my understanding is that very recently, uh, meaning last week, and we have a friend uh, who's just typed in uh, into our, our webinar chat here. Uh, Connecticut just okayed, okayed the sale of CBD last week. I can't verify that, but thank you, David. Uh, and, and if nothing else, that points out the, the critical nature here of how quickly this, cha this is changing. We also have Yukon up on the screen there. I wanted to just uh, for a moment say that I found uh, Yukon's continuing education program uh, to be of uh, particular help. The really good CBD uh, continuing education program there. Looking at these state examples of where the boards of pharmacy have ruled differently than a state at large creates a situation. Uh, you know, if we specifically look at, uh, this was the first time I had this conversation was with a pharmacist in Florida, where a patient can walk in, a, a steady good customer of yours, maybe a customer for decades is coming in and asking you about CBD and uh, they wanna buy CBD from you. They tried it from a friend or a neighbor or bought it online and they wanna buy it from you and they're asking your help and you tell them, I can't, I, I don't have it, I can't, I can't give it to you, and I really don't have good information for you. The scenario that that creates here is that patient walks out of your pharmacy, goes a block down the street, and goes into a convenience store, a vape shop, a gas station, and buys CBD. That's the problem that, that, that we're facing right now, and it's, and it's a problem that the FDA is aware of, the state boards of pharmacy are aware of, but I don't have an easy answer for you. What I do know is as pharmacists, we're not used to this predicament. Uh, we're used to being able to help our customers. We're used to being uh, aware and educated on these, on these subjects. And in this case, that's just not the, the case. So I wanna make sure that I applaud each and every one of you who's registered for this and listening to my voice and will be listening to this in the future for taking this first step of educating yourself. Uh, it's, it's something that we all have to do and it's something here at PRS we're taking seriously. So uh, a friend of ours at Spruce Mountain Pharmacy asked a great question when he registered. So is this CBD the snake oil of the 21st century? That's a great question because it sure sounds like it when you, when you look at some of the uh, literature and if you Google CBD, if you Google uh, CBD, uh, how it works and where it works, uh, you talk to friends and family because again, there are tens of millions of people using CBD products every month. We start to ask, how can it help arthritis, depression, insomnia, epilepsy, MS, diabetes, the immune system? Uh, it, you know, and it, it, there's 15 other disease states and 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 
areas of, of concern that it works? Well, the reason is that it, that it looks so confusing because we don't fully understand the endocannabinoid system. And the reason we don't is it wasn't discovered until the 1990s. So we need to, to have an understanding of how the endocannabinoid system works before we can begin to, to see how this isn't snake oil. There, CBD really does have effect in all of these areas. We're gonna leave this slide up for a few moments here uh, while, while I'm uh, talking about some related subjects. There's a lot of information up there. Uh, you know, those of you who are not familiar with the endocannabinoid system, please just uh, look at that and try to try to give yourself an overview. And I'll try to fill in some some gaps here. Uh, first, there are ten times more endocannabinoid receptors in the human body than there are opioid receptors. Just let that number sink in for a moment. Uh, the CB1 and CB2 are the, the designations of the, the two main types of uh, ECS receptors, but 10 times more than the than, than opioid receptors. So when, when you're looking at this illustration there that's showing the receptors and how diffusely they are uh, distributed throughout the body, maybe this begins to provide clues to how CBD can play a role in treating such diverse uh, diverse disease states that I had mentioned just a couple of moments ago. Because the receptors are located throughout the body, not just in the CNS system. So this neuromodulatory system that hadn't even been identified when I was in pharmacy school is proving to be involved in more reactions to main homeos uh, maintain homeostasis than first suspected. A particularly surprising feature of CB2 receptors that I recently came upon uh, in, in studying uh, how the, the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites interact, CB2 is actually able to be induced by injury or inflammation, meaning they can increase a hundredfold after insult of injury or inflammation. The opioid system is not able to do that. So again, this might be a, a beginning of a hint of how the ECS system and why cannabinoids and, and why this receptor system is able to have uh, work throughout the body. It might be helping you uh, for, with anxiety issues and insomnia issues at the same time that it's uh, reducing uh, arthritis inflammation. Pair that thought with a new discovery that the endogenous cannabinoids that engage these receptors, in other words, the naturally occurring uh, endocannabinoids, they are synthesized and degraded on demand up to a billion times a day. That number doesn't make sense to me. That's, that's what the research seems to say. But how that can happen is uh, they're from lipids. They're, the precursors are in the lipids in cell membranes. So it is, it is instantaneous reactions that the body is looking for the CBD to uh, basically have an effect on these receptors and it's happening uh, at, at lightning quick uh, speed. You know, I, what I don't want to do here also is I do not want to oversimplify this phenomenally complex system. So there, there is much more that I'm going to be able to talk about in five or 10 minutes here. But again, I just want to hit a couple other points to give you an idea of how CBD interacts with this ECS system. Imagine if we now know that uh, the endocannabinoids are being created in, in numbers up to a billion times a day. Well, let's imagine if we, if we begin to flood this system with external CBD. And now we know that the external CBD also has the ability to suppress the enzymes that metabolize these natural uh, cannabinoids, these endocannabinoids that are synthesized from the cell wall. So their synthesis can actually be enhanced because the external CBD is, is not allowing the body's enzymatic system to automatically uh, metabolize those. The, the other piece of, of the ECS that uh, I, I do not, you know, I don't want to pretend to be the ECS uh, expert here. Uh, this is, uh, there are people doing massive research 
constantly and, and the, the reports coming out on, on ECS research uh, literally change from week to week. But it does look like CBD, these external cannabinoids, uh, are influ influencers of every type of homeostatic reaction in the human body. <clears throat> let me let me move on to uh, some some drug information about CBD. I could talk for uh, another hour about the ECS, and I really don't want to bore you with that. But please, if you have questions about the ECS, or uh, if you believe I have uh, misstated something, or I'm uh, giving information from two weeks ago and there's new information. Uh, please, I, I invite you to email me, uh, call me. We're going to have my information up at the end of uh, at the end of this webinar. Uh, but I, I do want to move on from the ECS, and it's uh, something I would have a lot of fun talking about. But uh, I, I have a feeling that might bore you. So, uh, moving on to the drug information uh, about CBD that we have right now. Well, the reality to uh, to this situation is I am very hesitant to speak about drug information specifically for CBD, uh, especially in this public forum, because everything we know right now uh, about CBD and it's uh, how it's uh, used in the body, what the body does with it, uh, everything else going on uh, in terms of the dosing and so on, we know from Epidiolex. However, Epidiolex is a, a drug that the FDA, I do not want to say hastily again in case uh, Dr. Sharpless is on the call, uh, but from my understanding and what I've been able to read, that there were not the typical amount of, of long-term human testing uh, studies done on cannabidiol uh, during the Epidiolex process of making it a drug, an FDA-approved drug. Uh, so uh, it is a drug that is for a uh, two very specific and, and very rare pediatric epileptic conditions. So the, uh, what we know about it are uh, based on these unbelievably high doses that Epidiolex is used in. And when I say high doses, high doses uh, relative to what anecdotally uh, the, the tens of millions of people who are buying CBD uh, for themselves on a monthly basis, uh, the doses that people are taking on their own are, are nowhere near the doses that were studied for Epidiolex. So how I would respond to uh, the questions about, well, let's talk about dosing and, and, and tell me about, uh, you know, these specific questions about CBD and what I need to tell my patients, how I would respond uh, to a family member or a friend or in a personal uh, uh, in, in a personal encounter versus in this public forum are going to be very different. <clears throat> in lieu of my being able to give very specific answers that way, let me share some some things that we do know uh, as a result of Epidiolex and that we know as a result of these other studies being done. There's no evidence that CBD is uh, an addictive substance that it does undergo first pass metabolism. So we know then that uh, if the drug is taken orally, it has decreased bioavailability, maybe down in the two to five, 6% range. Sublingual dosing results in about a 20 to 30% bioavailability uh, if taken correctly sublingually, which we can talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, topical preparations have negligible absorption so uh, that's that's a typical question. Well, if I'm taking it sublingually and using it topically, uh, you know, am I getting some cumulative effect? Uh, don't want to try to answer that definitively, but it doesn't seem like it if uh, the the topicals have negligible absorption. So that 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 reminds me to uh, to make a statement that uh, the topicals may be a, a very good place uh, for those of you who are concerned about jumping into selling CBD with, uh, with both feet uh, to maybe dip your toes into the water by selling just the oral prep or the uh, topical preparations first. Let me, let me talk about the side effects uh, from, uh, again, that we know from Epidiolex. And that's why uh, the FDA has made some pretty bold 
uh, declaration saying this is a drug, and that's why I let off with that. It is a drug. So there are interactions that we can't pretend uh, this is like uh, having a, a, a glass of cranberry juice. There are documented uh, uh, interactions between warfarin and valproic acid. And in at least one study, it looks like the warfarin dose may need to be adjusted uh, at 30%. So that is not insignificant. We also know that liver enzyme induction is an issue that can be problematic. If uh, there's anyone out there who is uh, already uh, knowledgeable about the pharmacogenetics, we do know that CBD is metabolized by CYP3A4 and CYP2C19. So the drugs that induce these enzymes uh, can decrease CBD blood levels. So that may actually make a, uh, a, a dose adjustment if we get to that point and we're actually recommending doses of CBD, uh, we may need to look at these, uh, these inductions of these other enzymes. But again, I, I wanna state this drug information is based uh, basically on the Epidiolex that was pediatric uh, in nature, very high doses, doesn't seem to be any long range human tests. And I, uh, I for one, one am sympathetic uh, to Dr. Gottlieb, who recently stepped down as the FDA commissioner, who said, it's a real safety issue. There are risks of accumulated effects of CBD. It is not a completely benign compound. So I think that is something that uh, I, I was very important to me uh, during this educational webinar is to make sure that you had some facts that CBD is not completely benign, that we as the, the, the drug experts and healthcare providers at the grassroots level, we need to know that uh, there, there might be some interactions with CBD uh, when it might not even look like it to you know, an innocent customer coming in and purchasing CBD from us. One of the other main uh, uh, sort of categorizations of uh, questions that people asked when they were signing up were, what's the best brand to sell in my pharmacy? How do I know who's most reputable? Uh, what kind of difference is there? We are in the midst, PRS is in the midst of a national project to make CBD products available to independent pharmacies. We're trying to identify the manufacturers who answer these questions that you're asking uh, right now and that I'm, I'm trying to evade the answer to. <laughs> um, but basically to answer these questions, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you need to try to identify the manufacturers who provide certificates of analysis with each product, uh, lab assays, that they're pharmacy friendly in their wording. You know, They don't necessarily have a, uh, a picture of a marijuana leaf uh, on the front of the bottle. Uh, we wanna keep it professional, we want it branded as such. The pricing needs to stay consistent. It looks like there is a pretty consistent uh, uh, and, and a range that, that the CBD products are all being uh, made available to the public at. We'll be announcing the results of this project as soon as possible, but let, let me touch on one other note there when we're talking about a brand and what brand to sell in my pharmacy. Uh, you don't sell just one brand of shampoo or one brand of makeup. Uh, I, I don't know that long-term it's going to make sense to just have one brand of, of CBD. Uh, it may make more sense to create a department. You know, you have a hair care department, there's a makeup department, and you have different brands within that. Uh, that seems to be where it's going. And when I'm looking in uh, some retail outlets in Pennsylvania, uh, they really haven't made too much uh, there haven't been too many rulings uh, saying that we can't sell CBD in retail settings. So it is available in, in pharmacies and, and supermarkets as well as vape shops and gas stations and so on. And it looks like some of the better retailers are creating these departments that I mentioned where there's, uh, you know, maybe a line of uh, uh, topicals that, that say that they're, they're better for your skin and another one that says it, it treats arthritis better. Uh, your, your patients are going to probably define that for you uh, more than, than I would be able to do here. Uh, so that sort of ends my, uh, my dissertation, if you will. What I would really like to do uh, is, uh, is to open it up to questions. And it looks like we've been having uh, plenty of questions being typed in as I was speaking. Um, so Linda, if you could... 
Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to read a, a, some of these. We'll try to get through as many of these as we can. I'm going to put Tim's information up while we're speaking. Just so you know, if we don't get to your question, you certainly can, can call him and, and speak to him one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I invite that. Yep. Honestly. Okay, so here's a good one. Uh, does the pharmacist need to be an expert or will people just accept that we aren't? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think they expect us to be experts uh, when, when it comes to drugs. I don't think they'll accept us not knowing. Uh, we, we had the one slide up there uh, where the pharmacist was shrugging, uh, saying, sorry, can't answer your question. Uh, I, no, I, 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 I think, yeah, I think people will expect us. To, to be the expert. I, I, I wouldn't want customers walking into my pharmacy and my shrugging and telling them to go to the gas station down the street. Okay, here's a question that came from actually um, more than one person. Is it legal to keep behind the counter? Well, uh, it's not illegal. Uh, the answer to that question is I would first look to your individual state. Uh, you know, as I, I went through there, uh, and, I, and I think I made that pretty clear that uh, each individual state is where you need to start. And, and what is your state board of pharmacy saying? Uh, you know, maybe the, the other way that I would, re excuse me, respond to that question is there doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, prohibition to having it available as an OTC product, but I would just use good judgment there. Uh, I don't know that there's a legality regarding uh, OTC or not. So we had a ton of questions about dosage, but this was a good one here. It says, are all of the dosage forms of CBD the same in terms of effectiveness? Wow, that's a that's a question with a, a lot of uh, a lot of ways to respond. Are the different? What is it? Are the different different dosage, dosage forms? forms of CBD, meaning uh, you know, so, oil versus topical versus uh, tablets. Sure. Right. So uh, that gets back to the bioavailability uh, discussion that I that I had a couple of moments ago. Uh, we know that. Uh, if you're taking it orally, uh, you know, a capsule, uh, it's undergoing first pass metabolism. So that is going to be uh, the, the studies that are out now say that it's, uh, I've seen it ranging between two and 6% uh, bioavailable after an oral dose. So that, uh, you know, that's the answer to, to that dosage form. And well, how does that compare to sublingual? Uh, as I said, it, it looks like about 20 to 30% of the dose uh, sublingually is achieved, becomes bioavailable. But the interesting note here is that uh, regardless of, of what the bioavailability numbers say, uh, people have arrived at a number that works for them. In, in other words, how many milligrams per day sublingually am I getting uh, effect from? So uh, what, whatever that number is, and, and maybe I'll, I'll have an opportunity. Is there any questions about that? Uh, there, there is. There's dosing. Where should we should we well, start low and titrate up? That that type of questions about dosing. So, so let me answer a couple of these questions at the same time here, and I'll try not to lose uh, sight of the dosage form question. Uh, because the FDA uh, has this is a drug. This is Epidiolex, and there is not dosing information for us to formally and officially be able to give a patient. Uh, as a pharmacist, as a, a licensed healthcare provider, uh, unless we're talking about Epidiolex for those disease states. However, uh, there are tens of millions of people using CBD every month, and my wife uh, is among those tens of millions. And that number seems to be between 20 and 30 million people a month are purchasing uh, CBD in one way or the other. And until recently, that had been almost entirely on the internet. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we, we, we had an early introduction to CBD greater than two years ago. And just about two years ago, uh, in, in July 2017, uh, my wife started taking CBD sublingually. She suffers from arthritis in her knees. And uh, I, I have no fear of telling you this. Uh, she's 58 years old. I'm 59 years old now. Uh, uh, and my wife had begun to get some arthritis symptoms in her hands and her fingers were getting tight and sore and losing some strength. But her chief complaint was her knees. So, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out this CBD. She sees a rheumatologist, a rheumatologist said, sure, why not? Uh, so 
we, we started out buying CBD oil and she was taking what amounted to about 20 milligrams uh, sublingually every day. And after a few days, a week, I can't remember, uh, she was really getting no response. So uh, I, I didn't do this like a real good pharmacist. I did this like a husband. I said, let's just jump to 50 milligrams uh, and, and see if we get any, uh, you know, I maybe wouldn't do that with a patient. Um, we'd tie trade up slowly, but we jumped and, and we got her up to about 50 milligrams uh, sublingually on a daily basis and very quickly. And, and I mean, within a day or two, she began to see relief of some of the inflammatory pain. Now, interestingly, that relief was primarily in her hands and she had a pinched nerve from a previous car accident, a pinched nerve in her neck. And she saw relief in those two areas almost immediately and some lessening of the pain in her knees. So we, you know, I thought, all right, it wasn't working at 20. We jumped up to 50, she's seeing some relief. So we dropped it down to 40 and over the period of a few months, we arrived, just us personally, in, in my wife's uh, system, that about 30 milligrams daily sublingually was giving her relief. Uh, if we dropped below that, it seemed like the relief went away. Uh, we clearly then, if we're getting relief at 30, she didn't need to be up at 50 or 100 or 200, which is a, a, another discussion that, that I left out of uh, the presentation. And maybe if we have a moment here, I'll get back to it. And that is uh, the effect of CBD at very low and very high doses. But uh, to, to stick with this answer about the dosage forms about my wife, uh, again, Dr. Sharpless or anyone from the FDA or the State Board of Pharmacy is listening. This is not official pharmacist advice I'm giving. Uh, I am saying with my wife, she was getting relief, real relief at about 30 milligrams. This also gets back to the snake oil uh, question. Uh, interestingly, as I said, she got the relief in her pinched nerve and the arthritis in her hands, but the pain in her knees didn't completely go away and, and it only took the edge off of it. And if we stop and think about it, that makes perfect sense. CBD works through that ECS system as, uh, as it activates the CB1 and CB2 receptors, it, it is mitigating pain and other reactions and, and, and inflammatory reactions, it is not gonna cure organic disease. It's not gonna change tissue damage. My wife has significant tissue damage in her knees. CBD really doesn't change that, doesn't. So in that respect, uh, no, it's not snake oil. We can't say, oh, this will cure your arthritis. This will make your bones heal. Uh, not true. And, and, and again, my wife is living evidence of, of, of that situation. Did I answer the, the dosage? No, uh, the, other, the other item of the dosage form, sorry, uh, is topical. I use the product topically. Uh, I, I consider myself somewhat active and I'll overdo it on weekends, uh, you know, doing whatever the weekend warrior stuff. And, and I'll have, you know, sore knees or my ankles will, will, will be swollen at the end of uh, overdoing it. I, again, this is anecdotal and I'm just saying it works for me. Uh, I do not take it sublingually, but those dosage forms, uh, whether we're taking it orally, sublingually or topically, have completely different routes of, uh, or different mechanisms of action. Uh, and, and I probably don't want to go any, any further than that. Uh, this should be a, a quick one. So um, what, what is the technician's role uh, in the pharmacy with regard to CBD? technician's role yes uh, I, I I think the technician's role should uh, not thought about that um, I think the technician's role shouldn't really change of whether uh, the technician is uh, suggesting that someone take uh, ibuprofen versus Tylenol or or whatever they need to be aware of what's going on in the pharmacy. And I think they also should uh, not pretend to be experts in CBD and maybe uh, refer to some of the questions to the pharmacist. But uh, I, don't, I don't think the technician's role uh, in, a, in a retail setting really needs to change when it comes to CBD. Uh, real quick uh, about dosing, uh, there were a couple questions and this was on one of the slides I think too, um, is people are asking about GI upset um, with a higher doses? Well, uh, again, I can, I can go back uh, to, to real life experience uh, with, with my wife. CBD, the CBD, uh, the manufacturer that we use, uh, is suspended in primarily glycerin. So if 
my wife is taking uh, a strength that she's maybe getting uh, 30 milligrams in a half an ml, which is the, the dose that she's using right now, she's only getting a half m ml of glycerin uh, under her tongue. And, and by the way, uh, the recommended way to use this is you, you hold it under your tongue for 30 seconds or more and then swallow it so that you're getting uh, at least that, that oral dose as well. I'm not a big proponent in that. I, I actually told my wife to, you know, I told her I'd spit it out uh, it, because if I'm only going to get two to five percent, once I've already uh, extracted the, the the CBD out of the glycerin through the mucosal tissue, um, I don't know that that makes sense. But when people are are taking, you know, maybe to get uh, uh, 30 milligrams or 50 milligrams, they're taking it in four or five mLs. Well, they're getting four or five mLs of glycerin, and that can be working uh, on their on their lower GI. So, I, I think that answers okay. you know why we're seeing that. You know what? John just handed me yeah. here that a note. John, do you have the pharmacist this came from? Uh, I do. The the note here that the Texas governor Abbott, uh, hero by the way, uh, Texas governor uh, did sign the bill last Monday. Uh, Ryan, I appreciate you sending that across. Didn't. Uh, didn't get that. Do you mean four days ago or, or like 11 days ago? But regardless, um, that's that's good news. Legal in New York is also a question John has here that someone asked. Uh, not illegal in New York if it doesn't have any levels of THC. Uh, the city of New York, I believe, and don't hold me to this, uh, the, the city of New York, New York City, uh, is trying to make separate and distinct rules uh, from the state of New York, but I believe the State Board of Pharmacy in New York really hasn't said yet. Uh, but I, I know for a fact there are lots of retail outlets uh, selling CBD, and some of them shady and some of them maybe illegally. I don't know. Uh, uh, that, that's a question I, I'm sorry, I can't answer. I, the only uh, information I can really give there is I know there's a distinction that New York is trying to, uh, New York City is trying to differ itself from the other state rules. Uh, there was a question about the uh, ECS. Does CBD short circuit the ECS? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, it can. Uh, is that how it works? No. Uh, but CBD in high doses does short circuit the endocannabinoid system. So uh, again, that's why I was hesitating with the dosing information because the information we have is on Epidiolex where I believe the doses there were between 100 and 300 milligrams daily. Compare that to what I'm saying my wife gets relief from and that's about 30 milligrams daily. So uh, what happens at, at the levels where you're getting that much CBD pouring in and, and basically uh, uh, covering the ECS, yes, it, it can do that. But but again, I uh, I, I would beg off of that. And it's, it's an answer, you know what, I'll come back and get the answer to that question. There's plenty of, uh, of research and studies out there available. Yeah, one more question about the ECS. How did they discover the ECS? That actually has been a, a fascinating uh, thing because I was kind of aggravated really when I realized there's this whole amazing uh, body system, this neuromodulatory system that we knew nothing about, and as a pharmacist, I knew nothing about. As it turns out, in the 80s and 90s, they were doing a lot of research on why marijuana worked as effectively as it did in, in treating diseases. Uh, so there was a lot of interest post the, the, you know, the crazy times of the 70s and the early 80s when they were doing legitimate research on, on the benefits of THC, the medical benefits of THC. During that research uh, is is when they uh, first, I believe, in the early '90s, they uh, they found CB1. They they believed there was only one receptor, and then sometime in the mid '90s, '95 or '96, they found CB uh, CB2, that second receptor. So, uh, a lot of questions about brand. Um, again, how can you tell if it's a reputable brand? What should we be looking for? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Uh, uh, PRS, uh, as, I, as I said, we are uh, involved in a national project right now to try to answer that exact uh, line of questioning. 
Uh, for me now, let me tell you that uh, what I would suggest to a pharmacist asking that question, or hopefully there are many of you thinking the, uh, the same sorts of things, uh, there, there's a few things I would look for. One, the, it, it, does the product have a certificate of analysis? Is there a lab assay uh, that's available for the actual product you're holding in your hand? Because a lot of the problem here comes down to, uh, is there what it says on the label? Is that amount of CBD actually in this dose? And how can I be sure there's no THC? Because if you're selling a product with THC, uh, that, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, that could be jail time. So we really want to be sure that if we're recommending and selling a product in our pharmacies that it doesn't have THC. Well, how we do that is uh, there is uh, some of the more reputable manufacturers out there that we found, and there's four or five of them that are all sort of at the top of the heap there, where they actually have QR codes on the individual products that the patient will actually have in hand. So you can scan the QR code and it will, after just a couple of clicks, take you directly to the certificate of analysis for that batch. Uh, I think that's huge. As I had said before, you know, we, we want to have labeling and, and branding. We, wanna, we want that to be a professional looking thing. It's something we're going to be proud to have in our pharmacy, standing there uh, you know, at our pharmacy counter, handing someone a product. It's got to look like a product we want to do that with. Uh, you know, is it, uh, there are a couple of, of manufacturers that are actually uh, manufactured by a pharmacist. It's a pharmacist-formulated uh, product in a pharmacist-led company. So did I answer that question? Yes. Uh, reading a question here, do you have any insight on potential implications to the DEA license while this not being FDA regulated? Uh, yeah, the answer to that question, I, I actually just briefly touched on it. The only time this is really going to become a DEA issue because the FDA has already uh, put themselves in the middle of this process, it only becomes a DEA issue if you're selling CBD products that have THC. That's where you need to be careful. Uh, you know, when we're talking about a food additive and CBD, can you have a food add additive with CBD? Well, the FDA is, is the ruling body there. DEA is really only going to step in if you're selling products with THC. I'm glad you asked that question. I hadn't really thought to elucidate that answer. Uh, but I, I imagine there are people out there saying, I don't want to lose my DEA license. Uh, THC is, is how I would answer that. If you're selling products with no THC, I don't think you're in fear of losing your DEA license. Uh, are we running one more out minute. of time here? Yeah, right. we're running out of time, so we have the, one the more. The question of a starting dose. Do you have a recommendation? Um, boy, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to answer that question. I'm going to allow what I already mentioned and the the, circumstance, the, the story I went through about my wife uh, and what amount works for her. Uh, do I want to, on public record here, uh, give a dose when the FDA says we haven't determined that yet? So I'm gonna I'm gonna back off of that. One, folks. Sorry. <laughs> That's very PC. <laughs> All right. I. I I, I think we've run out of time. Sorry if I rambled too long there. Uh, this is uh, an issue that I'm passionate about. It's, it's uh, something I, I, I'm actually enjoying learning. I enjoy sharing the information with you. Don't hesitate to call if you want to specifically talk and ask me questions. My email address is up. What, John? We can respond to these other questions later. Oh, yes. We oh, yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll respond to questions. We yeah, we yeah. didn't get to all the questions. So we understand that there are questions that weren't answered yet. Yeah, we we absolutely will be responding to your questions. We got it. Thank you, folks. Uh, appreciate it your was input. Overwhelming. Dozens and dozens of questions here. I can't even really count them. That's, right. That's great. <laughs> They're just coming in crazy. I hope this is what you expected it to be. Uh, again, I've gone over time. Sorry. Thank you.